Creative Commons in Brasilien und arbeite für eine Organisation ähm, namens äh, Center for Technology und wird euch was erzählen über ähm, die technologischen Entwicklungen in Brasilien und neue Gesetzgebungen, die auch Auswirkungen auf die Musikindustrie haben und ähm, Net Neutrality, die sich doch sehr von dem Mainstream in den, und den Entwicklungen in Europa und Amerika unterscheiden. Also es ist ein sehr interessanter Vortrag. Ähm, herzlich willkommen, Ronaldo Lemos. Hello, uh, thank you very much for being here. Maybe you're skipping lunch at this time. So I'm very happy to be back in Berlin and to talk to you about uh, the recent research we've been doing back in Brazil. So basically, uh, my presentation is going to be divided into three parts. I'm going to talk about this idea of free culture in Brazil. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what's going on in the country in terms of like freedoms, freedoms of expression, freedoms, uh, you know, to use the network, internet is seen as a fundamental right. So basically, let's go. So the first part of my presentation, I start with this very interesting thing. When Chris Anderson, who is the uh, editor of Wired magazine, he went to Brazil like two years ago. His only demand was to meet with this person, that is this woman right there. Uh, her name is Gabi Amarantos, and she's a singer of a Brazilian band from a very poor region of the country. She sings this music style called Tecnobrega. So basically, I find it very interesting that you have Chris Anderson, uh, a person that represents the idea of innovation, Silicon Valley, values, uh, wants to meet someone in Brazil for, from the poor areas, from the poor region. So I, th I find this a very powerful image. Why, like Silicon Valley, wants to go to the Brazilian peripheries? Why do they want to learn uh, and talk to, to a singer like Gabi Amarantos in Brazil? So my presentation is going to answer a little bit about uh, this question. In order to answer the question, I will start uh, with a very important thing, which is if you think about digital inclusion, so if you think, for instance, how people get connected to internet in a country like Brazil, everything that you know about this has changed in the past three years. So basically, this has happened because of this phenomenon called the LAN houses. LAN stands for Local Area Networks. So these are basically cyber cafes with computers connected to each other in which you can basically play games or basically you can also use these computers to access the internet. So basically if you go around in Brazil, you will see land houses basically everywhere. Uh, absolutely most of the Brazilian cities, even in the Amazon and very distant parts of the country, they will have a land house. So this is a land house. This is also another one. They take like uh, different shapes uh, everywhere. This is also a, a land house. And this is another one. The interesting thing about this is this is not a governmental policy. This is the market organizing itself like small entrepreneurs, generally in a very poor area that organize these little shops in which they offer internet access. It's also interesting because they started to emerge because of the games. So people would go to these places uh, in order to play, for instance, Warcraft or Counter-Strike. But suddenly, things started to change, and not only gamers were looking for, for their land houses, but also, for instance, people who simply wanted to use the internet. So the public of the land houses, it also changed a long time uh, in order to uh, also receive people interested in simply using the internet. Just to give you uh, a few numbers, right now in Brazil, you have 90,000 land houses. 
If you compare this number with the number of libraries, for instance, Brazil has approximately 5,000 libraries. If you compare it to the number of bookstores, the country in itself has only 2,000 bookstores and 2,300 movie theaters. So basically, the absolute majority of cities in Brazil, they do not have a library, they do not have a bookstore, they do not have a movie theater, but they do have land houses. So basically, these are becoming some sort of a focus points for people to access information and basically get connected and receive like either music, films, etc. So they're becoming public spaces with a very important role uh, in the Brazilian society. So in 2005, of all the accesses of, in the internet in Brazil, 17% were made throughout the land houses. 2006, it was 30%. 2007, it was 49%, a number that maintains pretty much the same even today, uh, 2010. So basically, if you compare the accesses through the land houses, which is the green line, uh, with access at home, at domiciles, the land houses since 2007 became much more accessed uh, to use the internet than people access internet at home, for instance. So basically, if you go to Brazil today, the majority of accesses to the internet, they take place in these land houses, small shops, built from the bottom up without any governmental support that brought internet to very distant and remote regions in the country. So as you can imagine, it completely changed the landscape of digital inclusion in the country and brought connectivity to places that you wouldn't suspect it to get so quickly. Uh, and the other important thing is that it's interesting because the uses of the land house are getting more and more complex. So basically, a lot of people is now using it for some sort of public interest activities. You don't read Portuguese, but if you take a look at that, it's a picture taken from the services that are rendered through a land house. You can go to one of these places and pay your utilities bill, so your water, electricity, telephone, you can return your tax filings through the land houses. So basically, if you are a taxpayer, you use the land houses to return your tax uh, filings, and they charge you 50 cents of a dollar for that. Or you can send a resume if you're looking for a job. So they have this particular service. It costs one dollar. They help you to prepare your resume and help to send it for you if you're looking for a job and they charge you one dollar for that. So it's interesting because it turned from games to internet access, and then it's becoming a sort of a, a public interest office in which you can actually do uh, public interest stuff, uh, and they charge you a very low price for that. So that's the, the first point of my presentation, just to give you an idea about what's going on in the country. So it takes me to the second part uh, of my presentation in which I would like to talk about a more uh, comprehensive phenomenon of the appropriation of technology by the peripheries. And by that I mean not only the Brazilian peripheries but the global peripheries. So what's going on is that computers, internet, digital technology are getting uh, to poor regions, geographical, social peripheries, and people are getting really creative about the way they use this technology in order to create stuff. So basically, what's going on in Brazil uh, is part of this research that I've been doing for the past five years, and the research continues. It's called Open Business. So basically, in this research, we worked in many countries, not only Brazil, but also Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, and Nigeria. And we wanted to know what was happening when people appropriated technology, especially in their peripheries, in each of these countries. So basically, we did a lot of research about the Nigeria film uh, industry. I'm not going to talk about this but it's today, but it's a fascinating case. 
We also work like with Colombia and Mexico with their music industries that are emerging out of the disappropriation of technology. And of course, we worked a lot with Brazil. In Brazil, the research that we did is about this particular music scene that is called Tecnobrega. So basically, brega in Portuguese means kitschy, means cheesy. It means like very romantic music, very good to dance together, like with your boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, very like uh, people fall in love listening to, to these brega songs, mixed with techno, especially techno beats from the 80s. So basically what happened is that people in these poor areas of the country, they started using computers to create this new rhythm that became extremely popular and they then emerged the so-called Technobrega. Just to give you an example, uh, every year, this Technobrega scene, it releases 400 CDs per year. To give a comparison, like Sony BMG, that is the largest record label in Brazil, releases approximately 12 CDs per year. So basically, the f four major labels in Brazil together release approximately 80 CDs per year. While these guys, in a very poor area, they are releasing 400 CDs and 100 DVDs every year. So it's not only a curiosity phenomenon, but it's also a very important economic phenomenon, a very strong one in a sense that it makes a lot of money. The funny thing is, if you go to a store to buy one of these Technobrega CDs, you will not find them. Because what happened in this scene is that the Technobrega musicians made a deal directly with the street vendors, the same guys who sell pirated materials. So basically, they somehow skipped the intermediaries and they started delivering their music CDs directly to the guys in the streets who were selling uh, Britney Spears CDs or more recently Lady Gaga CDs or whatever. So basically, these guys made a deal with these street vendors and gave their CDs away for these guys to distribute them in the streets. So pay attention because it's not piracy. They have deliberately given their music to be spread out by this huge network of street vendors that before used to work only with piracy. So that's what started to be uh, in the Technobrega industry. So how do they make money? They make money pretty much by playing live in the so-called sound system parties. It's a sort of a, a, a party in which you have a lot of equipment. You have, it's very interesting because the different sound system companies, they compete among each other to see who has the most uh, updated equipment, the most cutting edge equipment. So it's a sort of a, a competition, a race for cutting edge technology. And there is really a coat of technology. So basically every year when the new equipment comes, they have to buy equipment all the time. It comes from the sky in a special party and people clap. So it's a very interesting thing to see how there is a coat of technology going on there. And these parties that take place uh, in very poor areas, they are very intensive in terms of how they use technology. So basically you see the different groups uh, you know, enjoying the music and like participating in these parties. And they are very important from the economics of how uh, the music goes. These pictures are actually taken by Henrik Motek that is in the uh, crowd here. And basically, if you want to see where the CDs are sold, basically this is the place. So you don't see the CDs in a store, you basically see them in places like that being sold in the streets directly through the street vendors. So basically, I'm going to give you very broadly an overview of how the Technobrega market works economically. Because this same model is pretty much the rule for a lot of the musical production that goes on around the world. So basically, let's see how it works. It all starts with the artists and DJs. They go to a studio that is generally a domestic studio in which you 
pay the owner of the studio probably $30 in order to record your songs. You get your materials uh, from the DJ and basically then you give them to the street vendors in the streets. So there is no money going up from the street vendors back to the artists. They simply deliberately give their CDs and that's it. So the public in itself, it buys the CDs from the distributors and the street vendors. And it also, um, the, the artists, when they play live, they are paid either by the sound system parties or by the concert halls. And the public in itself pays the sound systems and the concert halls, so the money goes like that to the artist. Another very important thing that we realized when we did our research is that this is a leveraged market in economic terms. So basically, there is a party investor. There is a guy who is either uh, an investor in terms of equity or a guy who loans money to the people organizing the parties. So he receives either interests or dividends out of these investments. So it's a very interesting thing because it allows the sound system parties to buy the equipments, to invest uh, in laser beams, in like very expensive uh, gadgets. So that's an important thing in the whole industry. And another thing that we realized that is actually very important is that the public, they buy CDs and DVDs also directly from the artists and the DJs. And that's a very important thing because these are two separated markets. The CDs and DVDs that are sold by the artists do not compete with the CDs and DVDs that are sold in the streets. So this is a very interesting thing because the CDs that are sold by the artists are more expensive. They come like with graphic material, sometimes the lyrics. And the CDs that are sold in the streets are a sort of a generic type of CD in which uh, they come in a plastic bag without any sort of printed materials. It's only the music and that's it. So it's interesting how the market div divided and how the artists are actually able to capture the present value of playing live. So basically, when you play live and you sell CDs, that's when you actually make money by selling them right away to your public that just saw your live presentation. So the Techno Brega musicians, they really understood uh, this very well and started like capturing the value of playing live. And another important thing about this is that this is a very innovative market. So basically it adapts very easily to the changes in technology and to the changes uh, in how people create new ways. I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, in a few minutes. But if there is one word that can describe the Techno Brega market, this word is innovation. So basically, they didn't lose time. When digital technology came, they appropriated it immediately. They understood that by making your music popular, it's possible to make money by other ways. And they organized their markets precisely that way. So basically, this is a very interesting uh, lesson and phenomenon that they learned very quickly in terms of not lagging behind in terms of innovation and digital technology. So as I mentioned to you, uh, this is a very popular market. And it's so popular that a recent research made in Brazil about who were the most popular artists in the country, it's a nationwide uh, research, realized that the number one artist in the country is a product of this Brega scene. It's an artist named Calypso. And the interesting thing is that among the 10 most popular artists in the country, other three artists are a product of this network uh, of doing business in a different way that is the same as the Techno Brega. So basically, this is important because it indicates that the public sphere is changing very much in Brazil in the sense that in order to become successful, you do not need the radios, the TVs, uh, the traditional media anymore. You already have a different network, which is widespread through the street vendors, to the internet, to the land houses, that already has its own power 
to create the, the phenomena of fame and artists themselves. So this indicates a very profound transformation in terms of public sphere uh, in a country like Brazil. This is very interesting because this year we are going to have elections in the country, so it's going to be probably the first elections in which it will be ob objectively possible to measure the impact of these new emerging networks in terms of like political changes. So it's a very interesting year for the country because these new networks that emerged in the past three years, they are going to be put uh, under test and it will be able to see how much the public sphere has changed in terms of how is it possible to create a, a, another system of communication in parallel through the traditional media. So I think this is also important in this sense. Uh, and as I mentioned to you, this type uh, of music and this type of scene, it's basically not only about Technobrega, but it's the type of way of doing business in many other parts of the world. So it's pretty much safe to say that a very significant portion of the way that music is made and listened in the world of today follows the same model of the Technobrega. So inside Brazil, you will have examples like, for instance, funky, which is another different style. You have examples like forró, another music style as well. This other one, Lambadão Cuiabano, Pisadinha. These are all music scenes that follow the same uh, style of doing business of the Technobrega. And it's important to mention that this is also a phenomenon of the global peripheries. So it's not only about Brazil. The same template for doing business this way is also applied, for instance, in the Kuduro style in Angola, which is a very danceable electronic style uh, music from Angola. Uh, the bubbling style from Suriname, which has also a very interesting connection with Rotterdam. So it's interesting because it's a, an international dancing electronic style that connects the two countries. Same way of do, doing business. Uh, the champeta in Colombia, it's also uh, a style of music from Colombia. The cueto in South Africa, it's a sort of a South African hip hop style, and it's basically the same way that the Technobrega was created, was pretty much the way the cueto was created. Coupé de Calais in Ivory Coast is another example. And the Cumbia Vigera in Argentina. I would like to stop a little bit at the Cumbia Vigera because this is one of the most recent parts uh, of our research in Brazil. And basically, the results that we got from Argentina indicate pretty much what is the future of these types of scenes. So I, I really believe Cumbia Vigera is representative for us to see what's coming next. So let me explain a little bit what is Cumbia Vigera. Cumbia is a very popular style, a traditional style in Latin America. It's basically popular in all the Latin American countries, with the exception of one, which is Brazil. Brazil doesn't like cumbia very much, it prefers samba. But everywhere else, cumbia is the, let's say, common denominator in terms of music in the country. This is the traditional cumbia. So it's a group like Los Sombras, the, the Argentina. And basically, it's very traditional way of dressing, very conservative in a sense, but this is the traditional cumbia. So what the cumbia vigera did was basically to take away all the traditional things about cumbia and mix it with hip hop, creating a very important urban rhythm uh, in terms of like um, a, very, a rhythm that is very connected to the street life, to the way that people live in the poor neighborhoods in the big cities of Argentina, uh, especially Buenos Aires. So it's a very interesting thing because it's a music made by poor people using electronic instruments in most of the cases for poor people in the peripheries. And talking about violence, drugs, with very hard lyrics, and is extremely popular in a city like Buenos Aires. So this is the, the Cumbia Vigera. Uh, the interesting thing about the Cumbia is that it started just like Tecnobrega, but 
the street vendors became obsolete. So basically, they evolved to a point in which they do not need the street vendors anymore. All the music is circulated by means of websites like this one that is called Mundo Cumbiero, or websites like this one. You probably might not like the way these websites are designed, and that's natural because they are not designed for you, but it's the way that people who like Cumbia Vigera like their websites to be designed. I love that one because they put a web chat right in the front page of the, the, the website, so you can chat with your friends while you download the, the Cumbia Vigera songs. So this is a very interesting thing. It moved from the street vendors to the internet, and then it moved once again. It moved to cell phones using Bluetooth. So basically, the number one way in which Cumbia Vigera is circulated in Buenos Aires today is by means of Bluetooth. So we did this interview with this singer. His name is El Cave, which is a short for El Cavernicola, the caveman. And this caveman guy, he said the following, that his dream is to go to a concert and get a machine in which he can tell everyone in the concert, turn on your cell phones. And when the people do that, he can broadcast his entire music collection, like all his CDs, all his songs, so that people can download them immediately using Bluetooth uh, in these particular concerts. So basically, it's very interesting because if you look for the traditional music industry, you cannot find a service that sells you music through Bluetooth in Brazil or Argentina. But if you look through the musicians in the poor areas and in the peripheries, they have been doing that for quite a, a long time right now. So basically, this is a tale about innovation gets first in these peripheries, and then after, maybe, possibly, it can get uh, appropriated by the traditional industry, and so it goes. So the future of these peripheral scenes is pretty much similar to the future of Cumbia Vigera. Cumbia Vigera represents what Tecnobrega is becoming. It represents with all the other scenes that I mentioned are also becoming. So it's pretty much uh, changing quite fast in terms of how they do their businesses. So another important thing is this concept of internet artists. So basically, you might think here, who are the, the German internet artists? Globally, you might think of Arctic Monkeys, Lily Allen, and other artists that have become, oh, these guys, they only emerged because of the internet. So they became like labeled as internet artists. What does it mean to be an internet artist in a developing country like Brazil? So if you ask someone in Brazil, who is the Brazilian internet artist? They will tell you that this girl over there, her name is Malu Magalhães. She is the poster child of being an internet child in Brazil, uh, an internet artist in Brazil. But no one is going to tell you that a band like Fantasmão is also an internet artist in Brazil. Because Fantasmão is not popular among the middle class and the upper middle class. It's only popular with the lower classes, lower economic classes in the country. And never ever people will think about them as an internet band. But then, if you compare the numbers about internet presence between Malu Magalhães and Fantasmão, the numbers are pretty much interesting. In terms of social networks, the most popular network in Brazil is Orkut. And Malu Magalhães has 140 communities, the largest of them with 27,000 members, while Fantasmão has 810 communities, with the largest one being 35,000 members. Uh, Malu Magalhães, in the traditional media, she has 77, artists, 77 articles, while Fantasmão has five, and basically in very much local newspapers. In terms of MySpace hits, Malu has 2.5 million hits. 
uh, Fantasmão has none whatsoever, because these bands of the peripheries, they do not use MySpace. They don't like MySpace. They prefer social networks, and they prefer YouTube in order to, to make their music available. And last, if you compare the most viewed video by Malu, it's 532,000 views, and it's a TV show presentation, so she's on TV, like, presenting live. And the most viewed video by Fantasmão is 1.2 million views, and it's actually a video that was not even made by the band. It's a photo montage made by a fan that someone just uploaded at YouTube, and it quickly got 1.2 million views. So this is not the exception. This is the rule. I wish I had the time here to navigate at YouTube with you to show you the artists that are considered famous in Brazil and what is their web presence, what is their number of hits at YouTube. And then I would navigate at YouTube with you with the peripheral artists, with the artists from the peripheries, and you will see that the rule is that they are much bigger than the traditional artists that have a strong presence in the media. So my point is, you have the traditional media one side, and you have these artists emerging online on the other side, which are so much bigger than the traditional media artists. So this is something to think about because it represents a change in terms of public sphere. Finally, my last part of my presentation is going to be about something else completely different from I said what I said before. I would like to tell you the story about a new law that is going to be approved. It's in the process of being approved and built in Brazil. There is a law for the internet and not against the internet or criminalizing the internet or restricting internet rights as is the case in many other countries of the world. So basically what Brazil is doing right now is that it's creating a law that has become known as the Marco Civil. It means a civil rights based legislation for the internet or in other words, taking rights seriously online. So this is something that is going on right now in the country. And if you think about the way this law is built, uh, you know the sentence in which people never know how laws and sausages are made. Well, in Brazil, laws are generally made by people like that, seated in a room with very limited participation, with no real feedback from the Brazilian society, and this particular law is trying to change that and actually changing that. So basically what the Marco Civil, the civil rights legislation for the Brazilian internet is doing, is creating uh, with the support of the Ministry of Justice and with the center that I direct in Brazil, the Center for Technology and Society. Uh, this is actually when the project was launched uh, three months ago. This is me. That is the Ministry of Justice, and I'm going to save you about the other guys in the room. I'm not going to tell you about them. But basically, just to tell you that this is a governmental sponsored legislation uh, that is taking place in, in the country that is being built from the bottom up collaboratively. How is that being done? Well, first thing was to launch a public discussion about principles. So during 45 days, we posted a document online using a, a special platform in which we posted the following issues. Privacy, freedom of speech, rights of access, safe harbors, net neutrality, and open data. So basically, we wrote a text, said, we want to do a new law in Brazil. How would you like it to be taking into account these particular issues? And then we posted it online for 45 days. The turnout of the participation was really, really impressive. So basically, this first 45 days was about principles. Based on that discussion, we then wrote the piece of law. We wrote the actual text of law with Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. And it's just been posted online on April 8th. So less than one week ago, 
this law that was built based on this discussion that took place publicly was posted online. So we now have the text of a legislation and it's going to be open for comments for another 45 days. So basically, for additional 45 days, you can also comment the exact text of the law. So you might ask, well, that's great. Um, this is very easy for Brazil because Brazil is so favorable to this idea of free culture. But that's not actually true because the way we got where we are today was basically because of a lot of public struggles in order to criminalize the internet in the country. So basically, in the past six or seven years, Brazil has been dealing with all sorts of proposals that were very, pretty much arbitrary. So for instance, one proposal by this senator called Eduardo Azeredo, that became actually known as the Azeredo Law, that proposed to criminalize the internet in the country in a very comprehensive way, just to give you an idea. If you unlocked your iPhone in Brazil, you would have four years in jail. So basically, they were going to criminalize very trivial activities uh, that were taking place, such as unlocking an iPhone or downloading content online, violating terms of use. You could get actually four years in jail for doing that. And believe me, you don't want to spend four years in a Brazilian jail. So basically, this is the situation that we were facing before. So all sorts of crazy proposals trying to create like from three strikes to a complete prohibition of using the internet in political campaigns. This was the regulatory environment in the country. The thing is, because of this radicalization, because of these proposals for criminalization, the Brazilian civil society actually got together. So we had a sort of a mobilizing effect in which everyone was actually trying to respond to these threats of criminalization. And the fact that civil society got together was very strong. So basically, uh, what happens is a lot of the newspapers started like printing articles about how this criminalization was wrong, taking up on the fact that criminal, the, that civil society was fighting against the situation. So a lo lots of articles were published saying the internet should not be regulated criminally. It should be regulated from a civil rights uh, perspective. We should protect privacy, we should protect freedom of speech, and not criminalize the way that people use the internet. So it's pretty much against the global trend that we see in many countries like France, New Zealand, Australia, Korea, in which you have proposals such as the Three Strikes Law, the Digital Economy Bill uh, in England, and so it goes. It goes pretty much against this trend because of the fact that responding to the a threat of criminalization, civil society got together and actually started to fight against these proposals and proposing a civil rights-based regulation that was actually protecting the internet principles as it is. So basically, uh, we've been having a lot of results and a lot of participation. The first phase had a lot of comments, like so we had more than 800 substantive comments. Uh, we also included like a Twitter stream in the process of making the law. This is the official website at the government. So in one side, you see the comments from people. In the other side, you see what people are talking about this uh, Marco Civil idea on Twitter, like in real time. And uh, you had the participation of a lot of important institutions, like the Newspaper Association, the Broadcaster Association, the Brazilian Bar Association. So it's a very interesting thing because it really got legitimized in the way that the process was built. And in the second phase, I mentioned to you that we opened it one week ago, we already had uh, 260 comments in one week. So basically, we believe that this second phase is going to be even more uh, participatory than the previous phase had been, and it was already very good. So what is not included in this legislation? What we are not talking about? Because we couldn't be much ambitious, because otherwise you were going to be 
uh, failing along your process. If you had too much ambition, it, didn't, it was not going to work. So we left behind copyright issues, telecommunication issues, and personal data issues. Why? Because copyright issues already has its own process going on. So the Ministry of Culture in Brazil already has, uh, for three years, a process for reforming the Brazilian copyright law and making it more friendly to the internet. So we didn't want to interfere in that particular process. Telecommunications issues is also left behind, and personal data, just like copyright, has its own process going on at the Ministry of Justice. So basically, uh, we left these issues behind in order to make this project for a civil rights legislation to be possible. Uh, in sum, uh, summarizing what I had to say, if this law is passed, and possibly it's going to be passed, hopefully still this year, we are going to have a new collective right emerging in Brazil. It's a right that has to do with seeing the internet as a fundamental uh, issue, as something that cannot be disconnected, that everyone is entitled to have. And more important than that, a collective right to protect the internet freedoms and principles, as we know today, as we have known for the past years, uh, in a way that they are protected from threats such as the, the absence of net neutrality, criminalization, threats to freedom of speech. So keeping the liberties in the internet uh, protected from all sorts of threats that might come in the future from pressures coming from everywhere. So if you are interested, this is the website uh, of the project. It's going to be, there is going to be an English translation of the law. The law currently has 33 articles. An English translation is going to post it either today or tomorrow. So if you want to follow and see what is the proposal that Brazil is proposing for the internet, this is the place to go to take a look. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. Gibt es Fragen im Publikum? Hello, uh, my name is Henrik. Uh, thank you, Ronaldo, for your great presentation. I have a quick question. How, mm -hmm. how do you fix the representational problem in the process of, of building this collaborative law? Because th that's always the problem of these platforms. Um, and I find that really fascinating how to fix that problem. So if you can elaborate a bit on that, I would be most grateful. Thank that's you. a great question. So basically what happens is the text of the law is going to be built collaboratively. But once it's finished, it's going to be sent to the Congress. It's going to be sent to the same guys wearing a tie that actually represent the people in Brazil. So basically, what the civil uh, legislation that is being proposed does is to create a very legitimized text that represents, of course, with its imperfections, uh, the discussions that took place during the process. This is going to be uh, presented to the Congress, and then it will follow its natural way of being approved inside the Congress. So basically, it's a mixed way of designing a law. One, it's open with all its imperfections, and the other one, it's being to be, uh, going to be decided by the Congress, which you know is perfect, there's no problems, there's no flaws, so it's going to be decided inside the, the, the Congress. So it's a mixed way of designing a law. Moment, I come home. Thank, thanks a lot for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm curious uh, about the periphery and political participation. As you said, uh, these, the, the people in the periphery, uh, both urban and rural areas, are very innovative in their mm -hmm. ways of engaging technologies. Um, I'm curious um, when, it, for example, you said that civil society is strongly objected to certain restrictions. I'm curious 
uh, did people in the periphery also engage in this kind of process and if mm -hmm. yes how and also um, the people who use the platform that you provide for the law you named a couple of institutions but do you have any data on um, other groups or is it again just a middle class thing that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure if you got the first part of my presentation about the land houses. So basically what's going on in Brazil is that you have these small shops offering internet access in very remote and poor neighborhoods and they are basically present all over the country in all the cities and pretty much uh, a great deal of the poor neighborhoods. And one of the partners that actually uh, participated and are participating a lot in this process is the Land House Association. So basically, you're concerned that, but are people from the peripheries participating? The answer is yes, through the Land Houses and throughout the Land House Association that is pretty much uh, very present in uh, many places and, and cities in the country. Of course, this representation is not perfect. There is a, a, a center of gravity that is definitely about people who have traditional internet access, for instance, the middle class, but uh, it's safe to say that there has also been a participation from the lower classes as well throughout the land houses. Hi, thanks very much for your talk. Um, two questions. One is um, what you did with um, Orchid and Facebook maybe other services to go along with the Marco um, mm -hmm. civil bill. Um, and also, why do you think, um, with a few notable exceptions, um, the rest of the world's music um, industry hasn't really taken on Brazil's new emerging model? So your question about ORCUT is, what is the role about it in this political process? Is that it? OK, so basically, uh, Brazil has a very interesting position in terms of social networking because it has Orkut. Orkut is not famous anywhere else. It's a Google project, but it only took off actually in Brazil. And the funny thing is that it took off in Brazil probably three or four years before Facebook was what it is uh, in the United States, for instance. So basically, the same feel of connectivity that people in the US have right now because of Facebook we had it in Brazil in 2005. So it's a very interesting phenomenon because the Brazilian society, those who have access to the internet, really got connected quickly through Orkut. So basically the rule is as follows. Whatever you do online that you want to have a, a significant impact, you cannot ignore Orkut in Brazil. So face, Facebook is really small. It's actually very interesting about what's going on because uh, Orkut really got appropriated by people in the peripheries. So you have, like, have like a lot of poor people actually going to Orkut in a very strong presence at Orkut today. And what's going on is that the upper middle class is actually fleeing to Facebook. So Facebook is still small in the country. Uh, the numbers vary, but it's something around 5%, while Orkut has 90% of the social network market. So basically, this phenomenon is very interesting because when the periphery comes there and Orkut gets really, really interesting, then people start fleeing for Facebook, the people in the, from the upper middle class, because it wants a sort of a more gentrified environment for connecting. So it's a very interesting thing that, that is going on. And uh, of course, the Marco View has to have a presence at Orkut. So basically, uh, spontaneously throughout communities, it's been discussed inside of Orkut as well, and it's an important part to it. And it's also pretty much about Twitter, because Twitter is really also picking up in Brazil. It's becoming really important for the Brazilian society. So I believe the, there are three pillars of public sphere in the Brazilian society, actually four. Uh, Orkut, YouTube, Twitter, and MSN, the Microsoft Messenger, which basically everyone, especially in the peripheries, use uh, in Brazil if you have access. As for your second question, can you remind me? Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, so if I understood it right, why the music industry has not, for instance, captured the value of this 
other industries that emerge from the, the, the bottom up. It's a very interesting thing. So basically, if you take the most popular artist in the Brega scene, which is Banda Calypso, they don't have a record label, but they have a plane. So they make a lot of money. And they have been offered deals with the record labels. So they came to them and they said, well, I want you to sign with us. And they said no, because the idea of business models that they have is incompatible with the ways that the traditional uh, record labels do business. So it's interesting because the very idea of success has changed pretty much in Brazil because being successful is no longer being hired by a record label, but becoming a success in the sense that Calypso has become. A success on your own, dealing with a different type of network. So a lot of young artists, they aspire much more to being like Calypso than being hired like to, to buy a, a record label or something. We have enough time for one question. Hey, Ronaldo, thanks for your presentation. Um, you mentioned an interesting phenomenon, which is uh, that there is a shift, it seems, in Brazil from, from criminalizing mm -hmm. uh, internet issues into moving it more to civil law, while at the same time the rest of the world seems to increasingly criminalize uh, the same issues. So what I was wondering is whether you anticipate at some point in Brazil a similar tendency, and if so, uh, why not deal with some of them at least already right now? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Uh, the thing is, the pressures about criminalization, they didn't disappear. They're still there and they're still increasing. The only thing that changed is that something else came up, which is a pressure coming not from an institution but from civil society itself, in order not to criminalize and to make it based on civil rights, so protecting civil rights. So in terms of pressures, they are not going to go away. Actually, a country like Brazil, the amount of pressure it receives, for instance, from intellectual property issues, like every year, the United States releases the report called the Special 301, in which it gives a grade uh, to countries everywhere if you're being a good boy or a bad boy in terms of intellectual property compliance. So this is a very strong instrument of, prop, uh, of pressure in Brazil. It every year receives like a report from the US and it has to mobilize public money in order to create institutions to fight against piracy and that's exactly what the country has been doing for the past 80 years. So it's a very interesting thing because these pressures, they are not going to go away. The only thing that is new in this scenario is the fact that something else came up, which is the fact that civil society organized at least try to, to countering these pressures that are going to, to remain there for, for a long time still. Vielen Dank, Ronaldo Lemos. Uh, Applaus bitte. Thank you. Um,